still speaking God. We are part of the United Church of Christ, which is a denomination that is raising their voice as an alternative vision of what the church can be and where God is seen as all loving and inclusive. In a time when many see the church as being narrow and out of touch, we preach a progressive gospel. Here, barriers of ethnicity, class, and sexual orientation are torn down. Here, everyone is welcome. So, if you believe in God some of the time, none of the time, or all of the time, you are welcome here to renew your mind and uplift your spirit. Whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Whatever you're going through in your life, you are welcome here. Straight, gay, rich, poor, PhD, or GED, we welcome you with the love of God into this community. Let us begin. My name is Carol Bustamante, and I am your liturgist today. Let's start with a call to worship. This is the day that God has made. Let us give thanks for all God has done and continues to do. Will you please join me in prayer? Holy God, we gather this day to give thanks for your steadfast love and to experience afresh your desire to gather all people into communities of safety, justice, and peace. With Christ as our guide, we seek to grow into a new self in your image, generous, compassionate, welcoming. Baptized into Christ, we seek to love all of our sisters and brothers with Christ's inclusive love that sees beyond difference and extends the hand of peace to strangers. Send your spirit among us and inspire our imaginations and wills in the things that make for peace. For we pray in the name of the one who was called the Prince of Peace. Amen. We confess as a reminder of our shortcomings. We confess to remind ourselves how we have separated ourselves from the will of God. Please join me in our responsive confession. Generous, compassionate God, you call us to live in peace with one another, sharing the good gifts you give us with all of your creation. You call us to remember that we are one in Christ and to treat one another with love and respect. to rely on you and to put our trust in things eternal. The one who forgives, sins, and answers our prayers offers of the fullness of life. Know that when you pray sincerely, your prayers are heard and your shortcomings forgiven. The good news is that each day we have a chance to do better and get it right. They were bringing the children to Jesus, that Jesus might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, Jesus was indignant and said to them, Of 
And Jesus took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands upon them. Now we will have a scripture reading. Psalm 78 says, Listen, dear friends, to God's truth. Bend your ears to what I tell you. I'm chewing on a morsel of the proverb. I'll let you in on the sweet old truths. Stories we have heard from our fathers. Counsel we learned at our mother's knees. We're not keeping this to ourselves. We're passing knowledge along to the next generation about the marvelous things the Creator has done. So the next generation would know, and all the generations to come will know the truth and tell the stories so their children can trust in God. The Word of God for the people of God. Thank you. Thanks be to God. Baptism is the visible sign of an invisible event, the reconciliation of people to God. The promise of the gospel is not only to us, but also to our children. Baptism of water and the Holy Spirit is the mark of their acceptance into the care of Christ's church, the signal and seal of their participation in God's forgiveness and the beginning of their growing into full Christian faith and discipleship. By what name do you call this child?
for the baptized. Proverbs 22, verse 6. Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Let us pray for the one baptized today, and for those of us who have promised to encourage Aliana to follow the way of our Savior and to show love and justice as she could. May we have the steadfastness and discipline to show her the way. May we be loving examples in her life. Gracious God, bless the parents of Aliana. May they always show gratitude for the lives you have blessed them with. Bless this congregation for welcoming them into our faith community. Amen. against all kinds of greed. 
for one's life does not consist of the abundance of possessions. Then Jesus goes on to tell us this parable. Now we expect to hear a story that will prove his point about someone who was very greedy. But the man in Jesus' story is not a bad man. There is no hint that he acquired his land illegally or that he exploited his workers. <clears throat> Jesus says nothing about the man who served the lands of the poor in order to raise grain for export. In fact, Jesus doesn't point out any sinful behavior when he said the man's land produced abundantly. But that's not all there is to this spirit. Jesus lets the landowner speak for himself. What shall I do? For I have no place to store my crops. I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And I will store all my grain and goods. I mean, what, sh what should I do? I will do this. I will pull down, I will build, I will restore, do you hear it? I, I, I. Now we get a hint. He believes that he is self-made. Well, I'm sure not are like most successful people. But contrary to popular belief, he is not self-made. Someone else planted those crops. Someone besides himself harvested those crops. Someone besides himself withstood the elements of cold and rain to care for his crops. And there was a system in place so he could benefit economically from selling his produce. And yet this man's concern is only about himself. And here he is having an absolutely egocentric conversation with him. What should I do? Then he answers his own questions. Well, these are my crops, and these are my barns, and these are my grain, and these are my goods. That's why he's called the fool. He has fallen prey to the notion that life particularly the good life, the best life, consists of possessions. The land is his, the barn are his, the grain is his. All the goods belong to him. But he has no neighbor. He has no need of God. He has no connection beyond himself. He can't see beyond the edges of his own field, nor does he wonder if there are some people who have no brain at all. This man is isolated in a world that he has created for himself. You fool, says God. This very night, your life is being demanded of you. Now, God doesn't call the man a fool because he was productive, but because the man was lost inside of his own distorted notions of the world. It makes me wonder what are the possessions that we make idols of in our life? I mean, what are the things that you possess that you feel make you secure or make you worthy or above so much of life's trouble? Because here's the compelling thing about this kind of Christian idea. Following Jesus calls us beyond ourselves, into relationship, into community. And here's the hard part. That Jesus' call has economic implications. This whole section of Luke is about the odd economy of God. Jesus summarizes this section by saying, for where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. I mean, you can't read very far in the Bible without bumping into God's odd economics. I mean, this man has 
no memory of God who commanded the people of Israel to leave grain on the edges of the field for sojourners and widows. Wherever he went, Jesus called people beyond the me and mine. Now, Jesus knew that this would be terribly difficult for people, seeing beyond our own interests. It's still difficult. I think even more difficult now in this time. I mean, I and my are more popular pronouns than we and ours. This is the same type of thinking that causes some to see the world as something of their own making alone. And any benefit should come to them alone. My neighborhood, my city, my country, my taxes, my idea of who is worthy. Dividing the world into us and them. Them, the ones not like us. The ones not to be considered as beneficiaries of anything that we have produced, whether it be food or medical expertise or housing. It's mine. It shouldn't be given to those who don't work. It's, it's mine. It's not to be shared with those who aren't the same economic class. It's mine. Not to be tainted by outsiders who would dare to think that they could be our neighbor. Yes, following Jesus calls us beyond ourselves. And Jesus' call usually has economic implications. Well, you might be thinking if money can't assure you the good life, then what does the good life consist of? Well, if you read the rest of what Jesus says across the Gospels, it becomes pretty clear. The good life is composed of relationships. Relationships with each other and with God. And as you can discover, if you read your Bible, the two cannot be separated. So Jesus tells us stories like the parable of the Good Samaritan that invite us to think more broadly about who we could imagine being our neighbor. And he preaches sermons that extol caring for the poor and loving our enemies. And doing good for those in need. Not once does Jesus lift up setting a retirement account or securing a high paying job as part of seeking the kingdom of God. I mean, I don't mean to say that these things are bad. These are wonderful things. Really, money can do lots of wonderful things. It can provide for you and your family. It can be shared with others in need. It can be used to create jobs and to promote the general welfare. It can make possible a more comfortable life. It just can't produce the kind of full and abundant life that each of us seeks and that Jesus promises. Yes, money is useful in building the kingdom. So it's not about the money, it's about our attitude towards the money and those around us. Okay, I'm going to confess. I'm going to complain. For me, it is about the money. <laughs> My problem is money. I think, oh, what a wonderful dilemma to have so much that I wouldn't know what to do with it. But on second thought, it's not about what I don't have. It's just that I often think or I often believe and act like I don't have enough, enough money, I don't have enough time, I, I don't have enough stuff. And that happens because you and I live in a culture that regularly tells us we don't have enough. Just turn on the TV, look at the billboards, the 
internet, everything says I'm insufficient, I'm incomplete, and not quite mm, where I should be. But if I can just buy whatever they're pushing, be it a tube of toothpaste, a new laptop, or a better car, then I will be complete. Then I will be secure. For our culture equates consumption with satisfaction. Our culture equates possessions with happiness and material wealth with the good life. Now let's think about our lives. Truth be told, I know most of us believe that what Jesus says is true. We know that full bars cannot give us what we ultimately need. We know that money can't buy happiness. But like my father used to tease, money can't buy happiness, but it can sure rent that sucker. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, most of us are seduced by the same message that captured the soul of the farmer in this parable. I mean, we're all inundated with the message that the farmer brought into that we can never have enough. And in this text, we see we so often get it wrong equating consumption with satisfaction and possessions with happiness and material wealth with the good life. So here's the temptation. Materialism or consumerism or affluenza or whatever else you might call it has one distinct advantage over the abundant life that Jesus points us to. It is immediately tangible. I mean, you can order it on Amazon and have it in two days. Or you can go to Walmart and have it right now. But, but relationships, but community, but purpose, uh, things that Jesus invites us to embrace and strive for are much harder to lay our hands on. And you can't hoard them. You can't save it all for yourself. <clears throat> so the farmer's mistake is rather he goes astray by believing that his wealth can secure his future. It can make him independent from others, make him not need anything or anyone else. It even hints that if he has all that why would we even need God? But I don't want to be too hard on the farmer because I catch myself dreaming that too. If I had just a little more in the bank, or if the mortgage was paid off, or if I had made smarter investments, you, you fill in the blank. Everything would be fine. The allure of money is that it creates the illusion of independence. It can create the illusion that we don't need each other and that we are of our own making. Scripture tells us it is not we who made us. The allure of money is that it promises us that we can transcend the everyday vulnerabilities and needs that remind us that we are more created beings ultimately and always dependent on others, most especially on God. And here's where I get hopeful. First of all, I don't think I'm alone in this, this struggle. And I know it's difficult to have a conversation about money and prosperity because most of us have brought into the cultural assumption that equates money with personal worth. So we don't talk about it, at least we discover that we're not worth all that much. 
So what are we to do? Well, I would offer three things. One, ask yourself, how much is enough? I think I've mentioned before that I spent some time teaching at a Dominican high school, and one of the nuns had this practice that she instituted for sophomores, a practice that the nuns themselves would do, where every, once a year they had to count their possessions. And so we did that for our sophomore class. And every period, every group of 30 girls that came in the room, every day they had to count. One day it was gym shoes, one day it was t-shirts, one day it was jeans, and we would hang it on a banner across the room. And at the end of the month, when you walked in to see how much you had no job, I just did a pair of jeans, and I would just say, okay, how much is enough? Well, the enough? The second thing you can do is practice naming your blessings. The elements of the abundant life that Jesus describes throughout the Gospels, things like relationship, community, love, purpose, may be less tangible, but they are more powerful than material goods. And each of us experiences them every day. The joy of a good conversation, the sense of purpose that comes from helping another. The warmth of a loving relationship. The feeling of community from a gathering with friends or family. The awareness of how many ways we are blessed each and every day. These things are always available to us. But an entire media universe pushes us to tune into what is negative or missing rather than what is positive and right in front of us. It used to be bad enough, the feeling I got mine, you get yours, but our current political climate reeks with I got mine and I got yours too. <laughs> so I invite you to begin a daily practice of noticing of naming and giving thanks for the blessings that are already yours. And this week the blessing is that we have a lectionary reading that describes my plight. For so often I'm like the farmer, I aspire to be the farmer. But this parable pulls me back from the brink. So how do we live an abundant life, a good life? One, ask yourself, how much is enough? Two, acknowledge how God has blessed you. And three, when you feel that, that, that materialistic spirit coming over you, when you need to rebuke that spirit, just hum the refrain from the Beatles song, I don't care too much for money. <laughs>
they go forward, of the seven people shot dead in Chicago this weekend, may the horror of the seven people shot dead in Dayton, may the horror of the 20 people shot dead in El Paso compel you to put your faith in action. To dare you to speak truth to power about guns in this land. May the peace of God live inside you as we live in a nation where our peace is shattered every day. May the love of God soften you enough to see the blessings that we have and to keep your heart from becoming cold. 